Good morning, buenos dias, bom dia. Welcome all and thank you for joining us. I'm Andy Tsao, a Managing Director at Silicon Valley Bank and head of our Global Gateway team based here in the sunny San Francisco Bay Area. We are so delighted to be hosting today's webinar with our longtime partners at LAPCA and reviewing their, their data and analysis on Q2 and the first half of this year. We have a few uh, housekeeping um, items here. Please take a look uh, for your own information. 2023 has certainly been a challenging year for the entire innovation economy globally, and Latin America is no exception. In Silicon Valley Bank's own U.S. State of the Markets report that we just released last week, we noted that U.S. venture capital deployment was down 48% year over year. If you look at that level, it results in a year that's sort of comparable to 2020 levels. I'll put a link into the chat um, in, in the uh, Q&A, rather, so that you can um, get a link and download the report for yourself. Um, Latin America and other global markets, such as India, are seeing a similar pattern of results, in a sense, an echo of what is happening here in the U.S. market. But I don't want to steal Carlos's thunder, and we'll be dive, diving into those numbers shortly. The uncertainty of the markets impacted Silicon Valley Bank as well, culminating in our own challenges in March. But I'm so happy to say that we are back serving the global innovation economy in largely the same way we always have over our 40 year history. We are still SVB and now a division of First Citizens Bank and combined we are the 15th largest bank in the US with a fortress balance sheet and much more diversity in our business focus. So it's great to be back with LAFCA doing this annual webinar again as we have in the past. Running through this morning's program, we'll have Carlos Ramos de la Vega, Director of Venture Capital for LAPCA, present his report for about 15 minutes. And then we'll go to our VC panel discussion where we have Christine Kenna from Ignea, VC, Paolo Passoni from Valor Capital, and Ben Savage from Clock Tower Ventures. For those who are expecting to see Adriana Saman from Clock Tower, she ran into a last minute travel problem and had to drop out. So we're fortunate to have Ben come in to share his insights. Our conversation will run for about 35 minutes and we'll leave some time for Q&A. You can, of course, enter some questions along the way in the Q&A section and we'll try to get to them and we'll wrap up at the top of the hour. So let's get started. Carlos, over to you. Thank you, Andy, as always. Uh, it's great to be with everyone here. It's, it's in such a crucial moment for the ecosystem and for being with such long-standing partners uh, from LAVCA, both SBB, Ignea, Valor, Clock Tower. Um, I believe uh, it's important for us to start actually looking at not only the bigger themes and trends that I would bet the majority of our audience here is very much familiar with, very much familiar with what has happened with, to your point, Andy, what had happened with the innovation economy globally in the last 18 months. But also we wanna go and look at the story beyond the aggregate numbers. So what does it mean? What are the implications for Q3, Q4? Or what, are, what can we expect in the coming months? So we can go to the first slide. Uh, I think this is a very big picture that we are all familiar, right? We're very familiar with the market adjustments and corrections that we've seen in the past 18 months, like I mentioned. You know, like in the first half of 2023, we're back at the levels of investment of 2018. Right, and it's driven primarily by four major uh, drivers and topics that I see here. One is, of course, the implications of monetary policy globally, and how is that driving the relocation within portfolios of investment. Number two is the adjustments if in if that continue to happen in public company valuations and multiples. Number three, of course, is how are investors waiting sometimes on the sidelines to find a market clearing price or to be able to do more efficient price discovery when it comes to the deal flow and adjusting expectations when new founders actually come to market. And number four is that some of the founders that we had seen be very well capitalized in 2021 are also sitting on the sidelines, just focusing on the operation, focusing on the recovery business model and actually not hitting the market right now for a new round of financing. If we can go to the next slide really quickly. We can actually even dive into this deeper by a stage. I think we're still very much at a very grand scheme of things. We're still very much looking at the big picture here. 
But there are three very important things to see here besides the, the uh, diminishing orange color here that actually marks uh, the reduction in growth capital that we've seen across the industry. Number one is how the level of investment in aggregate has stabilized starting in Q4 of actually last year of 2022. We're back at 2020 levels on a quarterly basis, yes. But at the same time, we can see what has been the role of local capital and local sources of financing that have played in supporting founders, both first-time founders and repeat founders, as we'll see uh, a bit later. Um, so as we can see here, the resiliency is still at the seed stage and early stage investment side of the, of the table. At the same time, we have seen the rise of venture debt, the rise of alternative sources of financing as founders who want additional sources of capital to support their growth, go to the market for non-dilutive uh, sources, sources, of, sources of fuel, basically, in this regard. Um, so it's very important to see here also how can this actually map to what we can see is the commitment to Latin America as a region from an investor perspective. What do I mean by this? A lot of this support, even at the seed stage and early stage level, has been granted not only by local firms that have a very strong mandate uh, to just focus on Latin America, but also by global funds that have set up Latin dedicated teams, Latin dedicated funds, or a, a specific percentage of their global fund to be allocated into the region. That, that, that cadence of investment flow has actually been propelling this also early stage and seed stage investment side of, side of, uh, of the pie, I'd say. Uh, if, we, if we can go to the next slide really quickly. I think in the same topic of resilience, um, we can actually dive deeper into this on investment stage. And although this, this data, and I wanna be very clear on this, is not showing valuation metrics, it is showing a proxy of what has been the behavior of the average and median ticket size by investment stage. Of course, needless to say, we've seen that correction in growth capital. We've seen that correction in late stage. And to some extent, we've seen the, correct, the correction also in early stage. What we haven't seen is a significant adjustment in seed stage investing and the average and median ticket size. Here, of course, there's, a, there's two different ways in which we can interpret this. The first one is from a supply and, de and demand dynamic, right? Like we can see that there's still a lot of uh, supply capital to be able to be invested at seed stage local capital in uh, founders. And that's why this averages and medians are still trending upwards. Whereas growth capital originally and historically has been coming more from uh, global sources of financing. At the same time, the ability to actually bet on founders at the early stage, founders are still racing on a story, whereas in late stage, founders are racing more on multiples and metrics. And therefore, uh, those have actually been adjusted, as we have seen before, to these public company comps. Um, so we can go to the next slide. I think this one actually paints a very good story of what has happening in the ecosystem, more on the silver lining of maturity of the region as a whole. Look at what has happened with the growth of Spanish-speaking Latin America in the past couple of years. Latin America right now, Spanish-speaking Latin America, now is more than half of the pie in terms of capital allocated into founders, founders head headquartered in Spanish-speaking Latin America. That's comment number one that I think is very important to make. Comment number, comment number two is what has been the ability of founders in the region to actually attract capital into their ventures and initiatives. We have seen that in the past 2.5 years, literally the amount of startups that have been VC backed in the ecosystem has doubled. That is an impressive feat for a region like, like Latin America. And of course, what is not included in this graph, and we need to be very, very mindful about that, is of course the percentage of startups that have unfortunately had to shut down shop just because of the current market, market conditions of the startups that have been gone through an M&A process, an equity hire process, or of course, an IPO or, uh, or listing process more uh, in, in a direct listing fashion. But this is just to tell you what has been, what I would call the deepening of the pockets of uh, founders locally to be able to support their ventures. If we can go to the next slide really quickly. Here are two, two very important things that I would like to highlight is, we have seen, of course, the importance of network effects around talent and capital in the main tech hubs, not only Latin America, but globally. That is the magic of Silicon Valley. That is the magic of what happened in Israel since 1990. That is the magic of what's happening in Singapore. In Latin America, these global hubs will continue to become uh, more, more concentrated in terms of capital and talent. We don't expect that to change anytime soon. But at the same time, 
we're also seeing that that talent and capital has become more distributed into non-obvious tech hubs that we are calling here emerging tech hubs. And what's more surprising about that is that the share of capital going into emerging tech hubs actually increased in this first half of the year. So we're seeing, you know, like founders actually uh, driving their operations from Rio de Janeiro, Fl Fl Florianopolis, Belo Horizonte, Curitiba, Lima, uh, which of course we would expect and look forward to see them develop even further in the future. At the same time that the core markets of investment will of course still drive a significant percent of the deal flow. If we go to the next one. Here, this is a very interesting analysis that I always like to, to complement here. With the correction globally, we've seen also a correction to the downside on the number of deals and dollars that women-led startups have been able to raise in the market. I believe right now that the, the average number globally is between 4 to 5% of all capital going to women-led startups. LAP identifies a women-led startup as a company that has either a woman CEO or a woman co-founder. And I'm very happy to say that even within a market adjustment, we're still leading in terms of di diversity globally. One of every four investments in Latin America has a woman CEO or a woman co-founder. This is a very impressive feat. And of course, we've seen that even this year uh, with rounds for Bring McNulty of Havi from Pamela Valdez from Beak. We've seen this Mariana Ramos from Groupie. So we've seen this uh, women, very experienced seasoned entrepreneurs who are able to command also additional sources of capital. At the same time, yes, we see a very promising pipeline because on the seed stage is where we see this uptrend of more women uh, commanding this, uh, this investment, while on the late stage, even though we do see like an uptick, there's still a, a lot of room for growth. And of course, we recognize the importance of other KPIs and financial metrics in order, in order to decide the quantum, of cap, the quantum of capital and whether a deal is going to go through an IC or not uh, at, late at the late stage investment side of the table. If we can go to the next one. Here, we also started doing a very interesting analysis on what we call repeat founders, or if you may, serial entrepreneurs. And we, we found this a very interesting trend on how the market is consciously or unconsciously de-risking the early stages of investing by betting on operating experience and operating experience actually having a premium, premium in today's market. As you can see, we actually are breaking the record of founders actually a repeat founders actually uh, gaining share of capital at the early stages, stages of investment, which uh, and this metric actually doesn't represent that much of an important um, KPI when we go to the late stage side of the table, because again we have other important financial metrics that take uh, the, the 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 usual the usual um, the usual benchmarks there, but when we come to the seed stage, I'd say is rather obvious to see when you're a seed stage investor. And if there is an additional finances, financing risk and restricted capital availability on a Series A or a Series B, it's normal to bet on teams that have been a bit more proven and that can give and get more uh, go-to market strategies a bit more proven or that are a bit more seasoned within the market, a bit well known, uh, and that they know a bit more. They have more of a footprint or roadmap to follow through uh, in the coming stages of the business. If we can actually go to the next slide. Then we have seen a very important also trend when it comes to the, the evolution of the, the involvement of corporates within the startup ecosystem. While it's still trending upwards, it's no new, not news for anyone that corporates have seen significant restructurings in the ecosystem, uh, not only in Latin America, but globally. And that has also impacted the deep pockets of capital that they can have to allocate into their startup portfolios. So here, what we can see is, well, there was still a correction in CVC participation, but there's also a very important trend that we've seen anecdotally of not only global CVCs still looking at deals and participating in new transactions, but also mid-market mid corporates that are launching new CVC vehicles with very good and very clear governance, trans transparent governance practices with their own investment committee, with their own investment process. And it's not just an opportunistic play coming from the origin of their balance sheet. These are corporates that might have operations in one, two, or maybe three countries. They don't, they don't still have a global footprint, but are very interested in actually trying to accommodate what could be access to new technology into their own core business model. Another important trend that I would like to highlight here is that while we saw in 2022 and 2023, sorry, in 2021 and 2022, what we saw, um, some corporates actually expanding their investment mandates into what they would call adjacent markets. That 
investment mandate has actually repositioned and refocused for most of these global corporates to just focus on businesses that could impact could directly impact their core functions within their core organization so we'll see uh, a reprioritization of their investment mandate at the same time which we also believe it's very healthy at the ecosystem level we go to the next one really quickly it's the last one before we actually go into our our, our very very much long-awaited panel um, but for the first time, LAFCA started doing an analysis of the 25 most active VC investors in Latin America on what are some of the co-investment dynamics that they have at a portfolio level. We found, for example, the way that this, this could be read is that Valor Capital is actually sharing 12% of his portfolio with Manishis. This is that data, two very important caveats. This data does not really consider uh, the entry point or the stake in a specific company, this is a, a specific, uh, this is a company level analysis. And at the same time, it includes data all the way from 2008. So it tends to be more of a historical picture of what could be, be seen for LPs as what is the degree of portfolio concentration and portfolio exposure that they could have when they allocate into Latin America. And the great story here is that when they, when someone allocates into Latin America as an institutional investor, there is still a great opportunity for diversification, even at a regional level. There's still an opportunity to bet in different seasoned GPs that are betting different uh, companies and different initiatives at the, at, the, at the startup level. And at the same time, can be still complementary. I can still drive enough co-investment synergies between each other. Of course, this analysis for more than the 25 firms can definitely be downloaded from lafka.org, like a small plug in there. Um, but I think this can set up a great conversation for the next 30 to 35 minutes. Andy, uh, back over to you. And just the last thing that I say is for our investor community, uh, we look forward to seeing you in Lafka Week in, in October here in New York. Back to you, Andy, and hope we have a great conversation. Thank you, Carlos, um, for a, a terrific presentation, as always. Uh, you know, despite the um, obviously lower levels of, of venture deployment, I love the way your report framed that there are more venture back startups in the region today more women founders being funded than relative to other parts of the world, more repeat founders, more uh, CBC happening in the region. So a lot of a lot of progress despite you know the obvious challenges that we have in today's market. Uh, with that, um, we're going to go to our uh, venture capital panel. And uh, Christine, Paolo, Ben, first of all, uh, welcome and uh, thank you all for particip participating today and sharing your insights. Uh, if we can get started with each of you um, to introduce yourselves and your firms um, and to just give us a sense of your activity level. How many deals did uh, did your firms do in, in the second quarter? Uh, Christine, let's start with you. Yeah, great. Uh, so great to be here. Thanks, Carlos, for all the data and information. It's always extremely interesting and useful for all of us. So my name is Christine Kenna. I'm a general partner at Ignea Ventures. We are an early stage venture fund and we invest in global founders that are building their businesses or expanding into Spanish speaking LATAM primarily. And we focus on businesses that are solving pain points uh, for the emerging middle class. How active have we been? Uh, if your question is within the last quarter, Andy, uh, we've gone through deals. I think we've, we're, closing a number of deals now, but we've done about six deals in the last quarter. Perfect. Paolo, let's go to you. Hi, uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. Valor um, is a firm that specializes in cross-border, cross-border from the US to Brazil, cross-border from other countries in Latin America to Brazil. We have been around for 12 years. We manage roughly one and a half billion dollars today. We have funds both in the early stage side and as well as the growth side. I, I particularly manage the growth side of the business. In the last quarter, we made uh, three new growth equity investments, one of which was announced and two not yet. And we made uh, four new early stage investments. So I would say um, consistent pace. We're not changing the pace of investing. We do see more activity in the growth side than before, that's for sure. As a lot of companies are emerging from Series A to Series B, we consider Series B growth already. It's a little bit of a different uh, terminology than, than Lavica. Uh, 
Um, I would say uh, uh, the part of the market that has been hibernating is definitely growth. And as public markets have rebounded, that has sent a signal to the private markets that uh, this is the new kind of reasonable valuation and companies that are doing well are starting to raise money. Example, GenePass, one of our portfolio companies last week, announced a new round of 2.4 billion valuation uh, that will prepare it for the IPO in the next two to four years. And that's a great sign for the ecosystem. That's good news, Paolo. And I guess no surprise that Cesar was able to raise uh, more capital now. Uh, ben, over to you, if you can wrap this up with the intros. Sure. Uh, hi, I'm Ben Savage from Clock Tower Ventures. Uh, I'm deputizing for uh, my partner, Adriana, who unfortunately was disrupted by the, the travel chaos in London yesterday and today. Um, try to fill her, her shoes here. Um, you know, we invest in uh, financial services innovation in uh, North America, Latin America, and Europe. Um, we've been doing it for, uh, you know, the past nine years or so. We have about 180 fintech portfolio companies um, across our whole portfolio, more than 40 in Latin America, um, primarily investing at the early stage, although um, a little bit like uh uh, Valor, we have an ability to invest in later stages as well. Um, our activity in, in Latin America in the second quarter was incredibly slow. We did one new transaction, which is the slowest we've been really since we started investing in the region. Uh, we did a couple follow-ons across our portfolio, um, but uh, much, much slower than uh, our typical pacing. Thank you, Ben. And again, thanks for stepping in last, last a minute. Um, sure. The uh, that that's a great segue to my first question. By the way, I see some uh, really good questions coming into the Q and A. So um, to the audience, please uh, continue to pop those questions in there. And if we haven't addressed them over the next half hour, we will uh, try to get to them uh, at the end of the webinar. So, um, guys, uh, to 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 Ben's uh, point in pointing at, at the clock towers activity is level relatively low. Um, venture deployment for the region, as Carlos showed in the LAPCA data, you know, back to sort of 20, somewhere between 2018, 2020 levels. On the other hand, you see kind of the quarterly funding levels sort of bottom out, right? We're bumping along. I think the last two quarters in LAPCA were 800 million each. If you go back Q3, Q4 of last year, they're probably around 900. So we kind of leveled off a little bit. Ben, you were talk, kind of split, talking about how you were looking at your portfolio relative to evaluating new deals. So I'd, I'd like to get a sense of each, from each of you, uh, how much time are you spending relative to you know, uh, your portfolio uh, versus looking at, at new deals? And a, as kind of a follow-on, um, have valuations, um, at the whether it's at the seed or the series A or Palo, uh, you know, at the series B and beyond, corrected uh, enough for you to, you know, be deploying capital. So uh, maybe Ben, if we can start with you looking both at the, you know, sort of at the, at the seed level. And again, if you can, you know, double click on, on where you're spending your time. Yeah, our lived experience very much matches Carlos's presentation. Um, I think activity is dried up, you know, almost to zero. In sort of later stage, um, there's a pretty good ongoing set of activity in the sort of Series A and B market, and then seed is always kind of clicking along, um, but certainly much much slower than it's ever been uh, for from our experience in the region and at lower prices. So there's been a bit of a of a correction. Um, I think you know there was a, an enormous spurt in seed activity in 2021 and 2022 in the region. And I think what's going on in the market now is that there's kind of a digesting of all of those companies as they have reached a point in their life cycles where they really require series A capital or seed extension capital to kind of get to the next set of milestones. And so we've actually seen more activity uh, in the first half of this year in kind of the series A market than we have in the seed market, which just leads itself for us to end up focusing more on our existing companies, many of which have gone out and raised 
you know, full blown series A and B rounds, candidly in a way that's been um, more active with more uh, structured processes with multiple third parties kind of showing up to lead these things than we see in our US companies actually. Perfect. Christine, uh, maybe over to you, if you can sort of maybe focus your comments a little bit more at, at the series A. And again, um, you know, obviously it's a high bar for for new deals right now, but uh, also getting your sense of uh, price right now. Have, have valuations come down to the point where you think it, they're kind of appropriate? Yeah, so I think contrary to what Ben was commenting on, our activity and what we've seen really hasn't changed significantly in pace. And I think that's due to the fact that we're focused so much on early stage. And, and we're also, you know, always have in mind that we're building a portfolio regardless, regardless of the vintage. And so it's, you know, we don't want to be overly concentrated in 2021, 2022, right? So pacing our investment throughout all of these cycles is something that's important to keep in mind. And so in terms of deal flow, we've seen a lot of activity uh, for those early stage deals to the point where our, we've actually, for this latest fund, been reserving the largest amount of capital we've ever reserved for follow-ons. And so where that's changed is one, having more of our own capital allocated for our portfolio, and then two, making sure that we're co-investing with other funds with deep pockets. And that conversation with founders is, you know, it's, it's how much runway do you have after this round? 18 months to two years, you know, and, and that's sort of, we don't know. And I know we're going to get into this conversation. You know, when do we think the market's going to kind of start kicking again? I don't know. Right. And so but what we can control is what is what are the founders focus on and, and how are they using their cash in the most effective way, being very cognizant of the market trends and what's going on. And, and so valuations, I could say, you know, they've come down, they make sense. But uh, at least from my vantage point, we were never part of that crazy whirlwind market. And, and especially the earlier you go, I think that the valuations are very adequate. And we're focused on making sure that the founders have the right ownership that they need uh, to, to set the company up for success for all the future rounds that are going to come. Thank you, Christine. Paolo, last but not least, and again, if you can focus your comments maybe a bit at the Series B and beyond. Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, my mindset, my framework, my way of thinking is anchored on public markets for the growth side. I do believe public markets guide how private market investors price their deals. Uh, the last cycle, especially COVID, created this notion that it would go public at 10 times revenue, which implies 100 times earnings plus for certain companies, you know, for most companies, at least 100 times. And that P multiple makes absolutely no sense. The new reality is you're going to go public at 20 times earnings, okay? And, and that's a good company, by the way. Bad companies is between 10 and 15. And that probably implies between two times revenue to four times revenue, depending on your P&L structure. Software companies, four times revenue. Regular other lower margin companies, two times revenue, best case. And that guides the private market. The private market is looking at an IPO at either at call it four times revenue or two times revenue. So if the company is growing at, 60% CAGR in the next five years, maybe you can afford a higher multiple, entry multiple. Maybe for a software company, you enter a six, seven times revenue so that you exit at four times revenue and then you make a good return, right? Uh, because you're still CAGRing the revenue at a very high pace. I would say the, in practice, we have seen the best companies raise new money, but in terms of multiple, the multiple is a 50 to 70% discount to what we saw at the peak. Okay. And the peak was a classic bubble, obviously, right? Um, in terms of absolute valuation, you might see companies raising at pretty good absolute valuation just because they're doing really, really well. If you're doubling your revenue every year, you're, you grew into your, multi, into your old valuation. And those are the good ones. The, I would say the ones that are not growing and they're not doing well, that's the difficult conversation because the down rounds are going to wipe out the cap tables. Because at the end of the day, you need the management team. You can't wipe them out completely. Otherwise, who's going to run the business? So there will be a massive fight in the cap tables of who puts new money in, into companies that are struggling and who doesn't. And what companies do you save and what companies you don't. 
And we're going to see a lot of special situation uh, uh, dynamics playing out in the growth side in the next uh, two years. That's for the companies that are not uh, growing. For the companies that are growing, they will have capital from everyone, from everywhere around the globe, because they're obvious. That's the other thing that I would say. There is a whole storyline that only the local funds will provide capital. That is not anchored in reality. If you just seen what happened in the next three, three months, you saw um, EQT doing gym pass, General Catalyst doing traction. General Catalyst does not have a local team in Latin America. Um, and uh, Goldman doing DGB. Yes, they do have some people in Brazil. But anyway, my point is the best companies will always find capital, both local capital and global capital. Uh, it won't be just one and not the other. It will be a combination of the above. Founders are globally connected. They can take a plane and go visit people. And if they're doing something that makes sense, capital will flow to them. Great, Paulo. And I, I think, again, just sort of underscores the point that the, the great companies are will always get um, we'll always find funding. Uh, and um, maybe, um, again, I think you did a great job, Paolo, in sort of looking at um, revenue multiples in terms of valuations during the bubble and, and to where we are today. So clearly, um, you know, there's been a uh, overvaluation during the bubble in realistic new sets of valuations. Maybe um, turn to to uh, to Christine and then to Ben on, on their comments on with respect to those later stage founders, um, you know, there, there's some 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 interesting data that our um, U.S. numbers showed in that state of the markets report that I mentioned before, which actually shows that median uh, revenue growth is slowing at the at the sort of at the expense, if you will, at EBITDA generation going up. And so, what are companies doing? They're they're kind of trading off. Uh, revenue growth for efficiency in the business to stretch their cash runway. And so, you know, as Paolo kind of alluded to, can these later stage founders, you know, grow into those valuations or, you know, are we going to see many people sort of say, including myself at times, hey, things are going to get worse before they get better with respect to these, you know, sort of valuation situations. And, and you know, maybe Christine, what's, what, what's your advice to these later stage founders? Well, I think the answer is it all depends on how large your coffers are. And that really has to do, I think, with some of the, the companies that we're working with that had really large rounds. They're an incredibly privileged position right now where there are incredible M&A opportunities that are that are coming out, right, with some of these distressed companies. And I think the, the best founders are thinking about, they've always been thinking about building their long-term vision of their company. And so, you know, their strategy has not changed right now. And, and I think those are the most prudent uh, operators. And so we see that, you know, they're continuing their course. If they have the cash, then this can be a great time perhaps to accelerate some of that, some of that progress. Now, the other founders that uh, were caught in the unfortunate cycle of, of not having any cash right now, I mean, companies die because they run out of cash. It's, it's, you know, it's that simple. Right. And so, Paolo, you mentioned the fact that you're going to see a lot of uh, th those investors that have the money to keep investing, they're going to wipe out cap tables. And it sort of doesn't matter what downside protection provisions you have. And, you know, all so like all bets are off when when cash needs to come in. And we've also seen a lot of those situations take place, which is really unfortunate for the investors. But the, the focus, again, is if it's keeping the company and the founders aligned to keep building, then then that's what we're going to see happening. So. Um, it, it, it's sort of like the advice is it depends where you are and, and how much cash you have. And, and it, again, it all goes down to if you're doing well and you have options, you will have you will have choices and keep operating. If you don't, then you have to uh, really suffer the consequences. Yeah, I, I agree with Christina. I would just add that where I see me adding value to portfolio companies is advising them on M&A, advising them on special situations. They're not used to dealing with those situations. We investors are, and, and that's where you can really help capital allocation. Now, having said that, worth remembering that the base rate of getting an M&A right is low. So look, I think these things have to be done very carefully, not like, oh my God, 
Now I'm going to just buy every shit company out there. Like you're just going to get a pile of shit. It's not going to be good. So, <laughs> so I think that that's a good point. Ben, how about from your perspective, anything to add? I don't have too much to add. I think um, Paul has said in his previous comments, you know, great companies will find capital. And I think that's true. I think the biggest challenge we as I'm going to challenge the thing we try to do with our management teams and great management teams generally know this, but um, sometimes you still need, you know, a, a, a partner to bounce this sort of thought process off of is like, you, you will be able to get capital. It just probably isn't at the price you've mentally anchored yourself toward. And I think it's an, an evolving process for both founders as well as existing sort of capital partners for these companies um, that, hey, there's just been a reset. And um, once you internalize that that's happened, it's easier to kind of move forward, I think. Um, but th that's easier said than done. And so we try to, you know, help um, help our companies and our management teams understand a little bit of just what's going on in the market so that if they did want to take capital, they have a, a realistic understanding of where that's likely to price. Yeah, that's that's great insight, Ben. I think in many respects with these more difficult, complicated situations, we need to you know, sort of get through them before you know the whole ecosystem can, can kind of move on, if you will. Um, so uh, maybe shifting gears a little bit. And um, <clears throat> I think one of the bright spots of the um, of Carlos's uh, data was the um, the uh, data on uh, funding for female founders. And uh, I think it was 10% of the money went toward female founders in Latin. That's really pretty astounding relative to the US and other markets. I think this came through uh, the last time we did this report at, at, uh, at the end of the year. Um, so that that trend has continued. And so um, to the group, and, and maybe we'll start with, um, with, with, uh, with Paolo from his, from his view, you know, in this market, have you have you changed at all your approach at looking at um, at diversity in terms of uh, in terms of funding? Does it, you know, how did you do so before, and does this more uncertain market change your approach? And nothing changed. And like we continue to look at business from a bottoms up fundamental way, and having diversity indicates a um, higher likelihood of success, just because people make better decisions when they have diversity. That's really the benefit of a diversity of any kind of gender, of um, sex, doesn't matter. Like, I think that's the point. Uh, I would say, uh, I wanna highlight that we had a huge exit with a female founder. Uh, Pismo had a female founder, Daniela, and she exited on a billion dollar transaction to Visa in this last quarter. That was a big deal. She's incredible. She's technical. She's super uh, unique. Same way uh, Mariana from Guppy, which is part of Valor Portfolio, she created a group to help new female founders, and they kind of guide each other. I find that to be quite exciting as well. Oftentimes, you lack role models, and, and, and as a result, um, that can impact your uh, propensity to start. So I would say those those initiatives by female founders to foster new female founders is pretty 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 awesome to see. Um, I think it, it's not like a goal to have percentage of female founders. I don't think any investor has that. But like the, you will look at with good eyes, uh, just because diversity brings about better leadership and management teams. Thank you, Paulo. Ben, how about how are you? How how are you, how do you look at diversity in this market? I mean, nothing has changed. Like, you know, there'd be no reason to change your commitment to the sort of signal importance of, you know, increasing representation. It's a fight that kind of never ends. Um, and so we spend a ton of time under any market condition thinking hard about how we can uh, enhance and improve representation across our portfolio. And there's a whole bunch of things that you know, we do internally as processes to, you know, at, at really all phases of our investment process to try to um, enhance inclusion and representation. And so nothing is really different about what 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 we would do um, as a function of this market. You know, I think in Latin America, um, for us, the numbers when we analyze it actually have historically tracked pretty similar to what our portfolio looks like 
outside of the region. Um, you know, and we think for us anyway, that's just a function of the activities that we're doing in the various processes we've built to try to improve representation. Um, but it's never enough. And uh, regardless of what the market conditions are, you just kind of keep fighting the fight. That's a good point, Ben. It's all relative still, right? A long, a long way to go. Uh, Christine, over to you to wrap on, on this topic and maybe a, a different twist on the question, which is, you know, and, and Paolo mentioned some great uh, female founders. Are there are there more female founders? Do you think in in, in LATAM as, as a percentage? Is that are there more shots on goal? Is that what's driving some of that? What's your what's your perspective, Christine, in your experience? Yeah, so I, I echo the the in terms of the percentages and what Paolo and Ben Ben said. Um, I don't think there's been any change given the change in the market. Um, I actually don't think that there are more female founders in Latin America than there are in the U.S. I mean, I sort of see both both sides. Um, and and I, I love that there are these new support groups that are coming out, but I actually feel that there are much fewer, except they're really strong, incredible individuals. And, and I think we need to have more of those role models. Where I am more concerned, what I've seen in the change of the markets is where female investors I think that those numbers are dropping. Uh, I know we're, we're going through, we need to get the numbers out, but you know, it's not only the, the market for investing in startups that has sort of come to this, uh, this winter, but also for investing in funds. And so I think the fallout of that and the ramifications is that a number of uh, women joined as sort of junior investors in Latin America and, and they're not all sticking around. And I think that's what will have a longer term impact. And I think we need to be very aware and focused on helping those women as they continue to, to develop their experience and track record as investors uh, that they continue to get the support they need. 100%, uh, Christine. And I'm gonna go uh, to, the, to the group a, a little bit off script here because you, you, you brought it up, which is, um, fundraising for for you guys in terms of the venture industry certainly I think again uh, I, I um I don't think Carlos went through that data in 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 um in his report but in the US uh I think fundraising for the second quarter for venture funds was down again roughly 50 percent um uh from the uh from year over year so you know obviously in this market where deployment is slow, um, you know, funds aren't necessarily going back to market. And uh, and it seems like many LPs are feeling a little over allocated right now anyway. So there's no not as much pressure on you guys to deploy. So from a LATAM lens, Christine, we'll st stay with you. Um, you know, what what's your what's your sense in speaking to to LPs about their interest in, in investing in the region right now in venture? I think the change in market has had an enormous impact on especially global LPs view and on Latin America. And so the risk appetite and ability and sort of interest in deploying capital. I think, you know, the, the LPs are the slowest to move, the sort of the last movers, and they very much, um, I would say, are overwhelmingly risk averse where Latin America was a region that they were paying attention to. Um, writing small checks or seeing it through perhaps some of their more established manager GP allocations that were coming into the region. And over this last year and a half, I think they've entirely just taken a step back. And so where we as a fund, we've really had to double down on our existing LPs and those LPs that know the region and feel comfortable with the region until there are more exits. And I think that's a big thing. It's like, what is that tipping point? I think, uh, you know, we've had some great traction and, and like focusing on DPI, that has been one of our key focuses of success for our fund is, you know, show show those uh, and LPs that are not as familiar with the region that you can return their capital, right? And, but we need more of that. And, and, and so as these companies that were close to exiting didn't, <laughs> you know, everyone sort of has this bated breath to see if when's that going to happen. I, and I think they're great signs coming up. But I think until those exits happen uh, and that money gets gets returned to LPs, it, I don't think we're going to see uh, much more international LP money coming into the region. So let me let me add one perspective here. Um, last year, 2022, India attracted $23 billion of VC money, both for the stage and growth. Latin America, $4 billion. Yeah, roughly, I, I, I'm not sure I have the same Lavka data, but that's basically the, the gap. 
one to five. Latin American, the market value of publicly traded tech companies from Latin America is $130 billion today. The market value of the biggest VC-backed Indian companies is $25 billion. So that's the story we need to tell. We produce outcomes, we produce results. We have successful companies exiting both in public markets and in private markets, but we're not as great at telling the story. That will change because obviously many of us will take advantage of that and tell the right story. And I do believe the trajectory of venture capital penetration in Latin America is upwards. What I have seen in the last five years is a proliferation, of course, of early stage investors because that's where you begin, that's where it's easier to raise money for. What needs to happen is the growth equity industry needs to follow, either with the early stage investors raising money for their growth uh, funds or new entrants as well. I think as, as an ecosystem that will uh, evolve quite a bit and the percentage uh, of venture capital financiation will grow probably five-fold in the next 20 years. So we have that positive win behind our back. I was chatting with a good friend, Julio from Atlantico, who produces an excellent annual report, which helps everyone understand the region. And this contrast with India really caught my eye because so much money from, from you know, US VCs, or US endowments and, and institutions go towards India, yet Latin America has produced much better results. It was certainly a good argument for uh, investing in, in Latin America. It was nice that some of your former colleagues uh, at uh, Bicycle got a growth fund off, so that's um, uh, some more capital coming in the region. Ben, how about from your perspective, from you know maybe bringing in a U.S. Uh, perspective uh, as well, just in terms of uh, your sense of um, LPs in in their appetite for investing in uh, early stage venture right now? Uh, I think. You know, broadly, the LP community is still kind of digesting what's happened over the past cycle. Um, you know, uh, a year ago, LPs were much more concerned. You know, there was a lot of denominator effect questions uh, in the face of a public markets drawdown. Given how well public markets have performed um, recently, some of those concerns have ameliorated. But certainly, as Christine mentioned, I think our sense of the LP market is that um, given the dearth of liquidity that VCs have provided in the past 18 months, as well as the draw on liquidity that sort of the private capital ecosystem broadly, not just venture, but also um, credit and, and private equity have pulled, you know, there's going to be some challenges, but, um, you know, the LP commitment cycle that will pick up sort of in Q4 and into Q1 will be telling, like looking at sort of the next set of vintages. And on the other hand, when you look at the data, um, most venture funds have called capital at something like 50% of their typical pace um, over the past two years. And so um, that implies anyway that VC funds will be slower to go back to the trough um, to raise their next set of things uh, across the community in aggregate. You know, I will say as it relates to Latin America, like we think it's the most interesting emerging markets opportunity in the world. Um, over the next decade, we've been loudly pounding that table. We hosted our annual meeting across our whole platform in Mexico City, you know, a month and a half ago. Um, and what we found was actually bringing limited partners to the region. We did sort of a fintech tour of Mexico City for a couple of days, like really helped with awareness. And I think, um, you know, a lot of uh, getting institutional investors excited about the region is simply getting them to the region um, and actually like meeting companies, meeting investors, and and feeling the energy on the ground in the startup ecosystem, which is incredibly vibrant, as the, the slide showed. Well, the, the good good move, Ben, and the, I'm sure the fantastic food scene in Mexico, Mexico City didn't, didn't hurt either. Um, you know, in, in, before um, we turn over, we start going to the audience questions, there, there are quite a few, maybe the last one, staying with you, Ben, um, you know, sort of Paolo was talking again about sort of, you know, alluding to the, a lot of the uh, growth stage funding coming from, from the U.S. You, you know, you as primarily a U.S. investor, 
uh, and your activity level in LATAM was was obviously pretty low for this quarter. What you know, what's your sense in terms of um, when you know international investors will you know sort of dive back into LATAM? And everybody's a bit risk off right now. What what what's your view at, at Clock Tower? Yeah, so you know, we we really are specialists in financial services innovation. So it's harder for me to address kind of the broader community. I think you know, in fintech, um, we don't really think it's changed that much in terms of U.S. venture appetite focused on the region. And part of this echoing Paulo's comments about public markets, like you know, the a lot of the public market activity and a lot of the exit flow activity in the region has actually been financial innovation. So it's, it's still a relatively good market, even if things have traded down, like they're still, you know, done well. And certainly like, you know, new bank has traded incredibly well, you know, year to date, um, which helps. So we haven't really seen that much of a fall off. Um, it, it's in line with, I think, what we would see from an activity point of view and just fintech broadly uh, in the U.S. Um, so at least with respect to fintech, I'm not sure that there's much that's different. It's just kind of a broad activity metric that I think um, will affect the region in the same way it's affecting the U.S. Paulo or Christine, any any thoughts on sort of when the international money will start flowing in more vigorously? I think it's already flowing as I give examples, you know, um, it's coming. I, I think we don't have to be too anxious about that. Um, and I think the, the important thing is for people to understand where those big outcomes are coming from. What's the root of that? LATAM is one of the reasons LATAM is such a great fintech innovator is a direct result of regulation, for example, in Brazil. Okay, which created the groundwork for payment companies for uh, now with PIX, open finance coming up and so on and so forth. That Brazil probably has the most innovative central bank in the world. And that's no coincidence that we have such big outcomes out of Brazil. I think that serves as a, as a proxy for governments in other countries like Mexico to adopt as opposed to fight the sector. I think that's an important point. And more uh, regardless, I think the learnings from Brazil help uh, uh, fintechs everywhere. I think that kind of micro level story is what excites people as opposed to top down, okay, uh, stories. I, I like things that are grounded on, on actual bottom up uh, drivers. And, um... Maybe folding in one of the questions now, and Christine, you're, you're, um, you, you know, uh, go ahead and comment on on international funding if, you, if you'd like. But um, uh, we had a few questions around exits, and so you know, as Paul is kind of staying, saying, saying, uh, or I think you said it actually before, more exits will drive more more interest in in the region. Um, and uh, so we have questions around uh, the current state of uh, of exits, and uh, another questions around uh, around exits through secondaries, and specifically, uh, if anybody wants to, to comment on a question around how are founders making out in some of these secondary um, situations? Yeah. Um, I, so there are a number of questions in the air right now. I think one of the important aspects we need to think about investing in the region and with international investors is to have local boots on the ground. So having either it's, it's a local investor or, or a local team, I think there's so much that is lost in translation, literally and figuratively, between how companies are run and grow in scale and can, can actually exit. And so the, the importance of those relationships between investors and between founder networks and all of that, uh, I think is, is going to be a key factor of success for, for getting these international investors to continue to deploy capital in, in the region. Uh, how are we seeing exits? I think one thing that has changed over the last few years that has been great news for the region has just been the maturity of the secondaries market. This has certainly happened globally, but we're actually seeing it happen and solidify in transactions within Latin America, although somewhat trailing in the United States. And so that is promising. Uh, the question of how do founders make out on, on these secondaries, 
at least in my case, in our experience with secondaries, is the founders actually haven't been involved. Uh, this has been more a matter of providing liquidity for certain LPs and, and early stage investors that are, are extremely happy with the returns to date and substituting those LPs in for a new type of, of LP investor. And so that's sort of a, a, sort of a back, back end uh, structuring for uh, the, the LP market and how they've had exits um, that didn't exist before. Uh, I do think though that the secondaries that we're going to see happen a lot more is for providing sort of liquidity for those early stage. Is it um, founders, perhaps founders that have left the companies uh, or, or other small angel investors that are on the cap table and that could provide the liquidity? Overall, though, I don't see it's not a good sign when founders are exiting through secondaries, right? I mean, I mean, I think it's like we want the incentives aligned, we want them fully engaged for the long term, and so I don't, I don't yet see that happening. So I'll, I'll tell you two things. One, I don't mind as much when founders take a few million dollars off the table. One, two, three, just to buy an apartment and you know have a family. It's okay. It's not great when they take out like 20 million, 30 million and become venture capitalists themselves. Because it, it's a distraction on their time and their attention. That that I don't like as much. There's a very cool initiative in Brazil called Beacon, which allows founders to swap their equity in their companies with other founders. And because the real need that they have for selling secondary is also diversification of wealth. They know that all their eggs are in their company what if they can uh, diversify that? So they already created a solution for founders uh, in that uh, in Beacon. So uh, I, I just want to highlight uh, those aspects. Ben, how about you? Any, any anything to add? Correct. No, I mean, I, I think those are good. Those are thoughtful comments. I have a, a ton to add. Super. Okay, well, we're just about at time. Maybe squeezing a, a quick. Someone, uh, there are a couple of questions on, on, um, on venture debt financing. I know uh, again in the report that we showed in the U.S. in, in our own report in the U.S. venture debt was uh, down. Uh, deployment was down despite the increasing demand, uh, but we're you know with rising interest rates um, and uh, lenders taking a a higher uh, bar for for funding venture debt as well. We've seen that deployment down. I think that's probably true in in LATAM as well. I don't know if any of the panelists want a, a quick uh, tweet answer on or or comment on on debt across their portfolios. Yes, down. <laughs> okay. Okay, great. Well, we are. I just want to say the early stage oh. side is not very good for that. You know, things don't even exist. It's gonna do lending on what. Uh, maybe you can securitize software receivables. Okay, get it. Maybe you're dealing with a lending platform. I get it. That's a different type of that. But generally speaking, you're just trying to create, you know, figure out what your economics are. It's not a great time to be raising that. On the later stage, the question is, what's your return on on, on the marginal return on invested capital? If you're gonna take that that effectively cost 20% a year, you better have what a 50% return on marginal <laughs> opportunities. Okay, let's prove to me that you have a 50%, then you should take that. You know, like that's kind of the conversation that is lacking sometimes in this. Yeah, uh, it, 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 yeah exactly. It's absolutely a, a new um, uh, asset class, if you will, in the region. Uh, we, we have a fund vehicle that we're deploying capital in, in Latin America. Please reach out to us if, you're, if you have any questions on that. Uh, final question, a few people asked, hey, how do we get in touch with you guys if we have companies that are looking for funding? Any any uh, quick remarks there? Um, just around the horn, how, how do they get in touch with each of you? Email, website, LinkedIn, reach out. Same for Ben. Paolo, anything to add? Yeah, we have an email called prospects at um, valorcapitalgroup.com. So you can, you can send an email to that. Or there, we have 20 odd people in the ground. So you can reach out to any of them, uh, or you can do LinkedIn as Christine said. I, I, I do LinkedIn. So awesome. feel free to, to reach out. Thank you. All right. Well, um, that uh, we're at the top of the hour. That wraps things up. Um, I want to thank uh, Carlos, uh, Christine, Ben, and Paulo um, for uh, your, all your comments today. Uh, Carlos, again, great, uh, great review of the report. 
I want to thank uh, again each of you and all of you who joined our Zoom today. Uh, thanks for tuning in, and um, let's see how the rest of the year plays out. Looking forward to the next time we get together, and we'll we'll see uh, if our predictions or comments are accurate or not in hindsight. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.